بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد افتح باب رحمه الله وسر الاسرار ونور الانوار المجتبى والمختار وعلى اله واصحابه الاخيار المهاجرين والانصار وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته So inshallah ta'ala I'm going to speak tonight uh, on the topic of the existence of, of God. This is a talk I did uh, a couple of months ago uh, in San Jose at SBIA. Um, so Brother Powell had a good idea that I come here and uh, uh, give the same presentation inshallah ta'ala. Uh, won't take too much of your time and then we'll uh, pray Isha. Maybe we can do a Q&A session after. Inshallah ta'ala. Okay, so t- tonight's uh, lecture is uh, going to be more kind of classroom, academic, rather than like a sermon. Um, so basically, to begin, there are two approaches to the, quote, God question. Uh, there's, no, there's what's known as presuppositionalism, uh, which means to presuppose the existence uh, of God. Here we look at revealed theology. This is actually my specialty, looking at the Quran and the Bible and things like that, Old and New Testaments, looking at the language, the context of scripture, things like that. Um, so we presuppose God's existence here, uh, and we seek to know him more personally. So presuppositionalism, uh, the object here is to have ma'rifah, or to have <clears throat> divine knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, intimate knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So like a Muslim-Christian debate, a Muslim and a Christian are not going to debate, does God exist? Because they both presuppose God, right? They both believe he exists. So that's not the topic of the debate. <coughs> the topic of the debate <coughs> between a Muslim and a Christian is uh, what is the way to God? Uh, is the Bible the word of God? Is the Quran the word of God? Is Isa alayhi salam God? Is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam the messenger of God? So that's one approach, presuppositionalism. The other approach is called evidentialism, uh, and this is where, uh, and this is called natural theology, it's called philosophical theism, William Craig Lane calls it that. Uh, here we look at evidence, we don't look at scripture. Uh, so we look at logic, we look at philosophy, these types of evidences. We look at reason and science, we employ deductive or uh, syllogistic arguments that are not strictly theological, uh, but may have theological implications. Um, what was that? Oh, syllogistic. We'll talk about a syllogism, inshallah. We'll talk about that. I'll give you some examples of a, of a syllogism. It's a form of argument that's um, attributed to Aristotle. So look at that, inshallah. So here, with uh, evidentialism, uh, the Muslim and the Christian will join forces, as it were, against the atheist, right? Because they both believe in God, but the question here is not what does this God reveal about himself? The question here is, is there a God? If you look at our shahada, right? La ilaha, that's atheism. Illallah, that's deism, right? Belief in a God, la ilaha illallah. You believe that there's no God but the God or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's deism. God created, but he may not be personal. Muhammad Rasulullah, that's theism. God is personal. <clears throat> okay. So tonight we're going to be looking primarily at evidentialism, this approach to the God question. Now let's look at examples of syllogisms, okay? Again, this is a form of argument that's attributed to Aristotle. Uh, simple argument. I'll give you an example. Premise number one, all men are mortal. Premise number two, George Washington was a man. Therefore, right, our conclusion that follows logically and inescapably is that George Washington was a mortal. <clears throat> so this is an airtight, logical argument. You might even say that our premises are self-evident. They're axiomatic. They're just accepted on their face. You don't have to prove your premises. Right? Unless somebody has some weird theory about George Washington was a jinn or a vampire or something like that. But most people say, no, George Washington was, uh, all men are mortal. George Washington was a man. Therefore, George Washington was a mortal. <clears throat> so another example. Premise number one, the universe is ordered. Premise number two, this is either by chance or design. Premise number three, this is not by chance. 
Therefore, our logical conclusion is it is by design. So this is a log logical argument, but the problem here with this argument is that it could be potentially what's known as question begging, a question begging syllogism. What does it mean for an for argument to be question begging? It means that we haven't proven or demonstrated our premises. Our first premise was the universe is ordered. That may not be self-evident. You may not agree with that. It may not be axiomatic. You might want me to provide evidence of that. So even though this is a logical argument, we have some work to do by providing dala'il or proofs for our premises. You also have an argument that flows logically, but whose premises are axiomatically untrue or irrational. For example, premise number one, all donkeys can speak English. Premise number two, Gary is my pet donkey. Therefore, Gary can speak English. There's a logical argument. The logic is airtight, but it's irrational. It's axiomatically untrue. Now, if you look at the arguments of what are known as the four horsemen of neo-atheism, right, the new atheist movement, these are Christopher Hitchens. His book is called God is Not Great. They have different books. Uh, Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, Sam Harris, The End of Faith, Daniel Dennett, uh, Breaking the Spell. If you look at their arguments against God, they primarily revolve around issues of social impact of religion. In other words, uh, religion, religious people are bad, uh, therefore there is no God. Right? They look at, there's Hitler, there's pedophile priests, there's suicide bombings, uh, there's ISIS, this type of thing. So before we continue, I want to make a distinction here, very important distinction between an atheist and a new atheist. An atheist is someone who does not believe in a god and follows no religion, right? Uh, or someone who doesn't believe in a personal god. That's technically also an atheist. In other words, somebody believes that there's a creator, a great architect, but this god doesn't interact with humanity. He doesn't send scriptures or send messiahs or prophets, right? So the first six presidents of the United States probably were deist, right? In Washington, uh, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, John Quincy Adams were probably deists. And then the first uh, proper Christian was uh, Andrew Jackson. A new atheist, like Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, these characters that are so prominent nowadays, these are more properly called anti-theists rather than atheists an anti-theist. So this is someone who is opposed to the belief in the existence of God, opposed to it, and actually believes that religion must be eradicated from the face of the earth. Right? So it's a more militant form of atheism. It started around the 19th century with the writings of Karl Marx. Uh, he said that religion is the opium of the people and must be abolished. Uh, anti-theism is demonstrated by a famous statement of Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens, who said, uh, there is no God and I hate him. Right? <clears throat> so these are the anti-theists. Right? So, yeah, even if he did exist, right? Even if he did exist, he would continue to hate him. This is the kind of mentality we're dealing with. If we put their, their argument into a syllogism, it would sound something like this. Premise number one, theists say God is good. Premise number two, God created man. Premise number three, man does evil or non-good, therefore God does not exist. This is called a non sequitur argument. It does not follow. This is an illogical argument. So you have people like Bill Maher and Sam Harris, right? And they're talking about ISIS. And they're saying, look, uh, Islam is an inherently evil religion because of ISIS. Right? The adherents to ISIS are less than 1% of 1% of the Muslims globally. So I can use the same type of argument and say, look, five of the last 12 uh, Nobel Peace laureates, five of the last 12, almost half, were Muslim. Therefore, all Muslims are peaceful. They wouldn't accept that. Right? And that's 5 out of 12, not 1% of 1%. Or what if I said something like, because Bill, Bill Maher, he's an atheist, but his mother is Jewish, so he's ethnically Jewish. Same as Sam Harris, ethnically Jewish. 
Christopher Hitchens, eth ethnically Jewish. That's why I said all ethnic Jews are bigoted, hate-filled ignoramuses. Would they accept that? Of course they wouldn't, and I wouldn't make that argument either, because that's a racist argument, and it does not follow. It's a non-sequitur argument, and that's what people are listening to. These four, four horsemen, right, they think that if we just turn every mosque and church and synagogue into a Starbucks or a Chuck E. Cheese or a Hooters, everything's going to be okay, right? Imagine a world without religion, as John Lennon said. Imagine, and no religion too. Of course, John Lennon was a Beatle. And the Beatles actually brought Aleister Crowley into popular culture. Aleister Crowley is the founder of the Church of Satan, the founder of the Thelemites. He called himself the great Therion, the great beast of the book of Revelation. They put him on the cover of their Lonely Hearts Club band. There's all these satanic imagery that they keep doing. So these are Satanists. They, John Lennon used to know how to sing backwards, which is a, a trick that Satanists used. Allahu alam. Anyway, uh, the classical atheists now, the classical atheists, what I call the original gangsters of atheism. These are Freud, who said God is dad. Nietzsche, God is dead. And Bertrand Russell. These people were at least smart enough to know that if you take God out of the equation, the world would fall into this nihilistic quagmire, right? Utter social and moral depravity. So they understood that it was primarily religion that moralized people, and that the purpose of religion was to make one a more compassionate or better human being. As Voltaire said, if God did not exist, we would have to invent him. As Dostoevsky said, if there is no God, then all is permitted. If there is no God, then all is permitted. In other words, if there is no moral authority, there is no higher moral authority, you don't have a moral anchor. It's my morality, as I perceive it to be, against yours, then what's going to happen in the world, right? What's going to be our guiding moral principle? Survival of the fittest, right? So I can kill you and say, well, that's the law of nature, survival of the fittest. Or is it the Crowleyan, Luciferian, do what thou wilt, right? Do whatever you want, right? What's that? I quote it. I, why didn't I include Darwin? Yes. Oh, I'll get to. Oh, I'll get to Darwin in Shalom. I'll get to him. Yeah. Well, we'll talk. We'll definitely talk about Darwin. <laughs> we can't. You can't leave out. Leave out the man. You know, Darwin. Yes. Of course, we'll talk about him. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the moral anchor of Abrahamic tradition. What is the moral anchor of Abrahamic tradition? If the moral anchor of, or if the uh, chief axiom of atheism is survival of the fittest, and the moral anchor or uh, a credo of Satanism, which has grown in popularity, is do whatever you want, what is the moral anchor of Abrahamic tradition? So this is answered in uh, several sources. A second century rabbi named Hillel was asked, what is the Torah in a nutshell? And he quoted three verses, Deuteronomy 6.4, 6.5, Leviticus 19.18. So this is the uh, essence of the Torah. He said everything else is commentary. What does it say? 6.4, Deuteronomy, God is one. Deuteronomy 6.5, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and strength. Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor, meaning your fellow man, meaning fellow human, as yourself. Love of God, love of humanity. Interestingly, in a Christian source, the Gospel of Mark, a scribe comes to Isa alayhi salam, according to this source, and says to him, what is the greatest commandment? And Isa alayhi salam, he quotes these three verses verbatim from the Torah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مُصَدِّقَ لِمَ بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ Torah." That Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he simply confirmed the theology of the Torah. He said, God is one, love God, and love your neighbor. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, he says in a famous hadith, Hadith Rahmah, the hadith of mercy. And this, in traditional uh, Islamic curriculums, was the first hadith that children were taught at five years old. I think this microphone. Oh. There you go. 
The first hadith that they were taught, five years old. Ar-Rahimuni yarhamuhumur Rahman. Irhamu man fil ard, yarhamukum man fil sama. Rawahu Ahmad. Aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, he said, uh, the most merciful shows mercy to those who show mercy. Show mercy to those on earth and the one in heaven will show you mercy. How many times did he mention rahmah? Five or six times. Because this is very important to ingrain or inculcate into the child's mind this virtue of rahmah. So his entire, the basis of his entire Islamic education is mercy. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لا تدخل الجنة حتى تؤمنوا ولا تؤمن حتى تحبوا None of you will enter paradise until you truly believe. And none of you will truly believe until you love one another. Shall I tell you something that will increase your love? And they said, yes. He said, salama baynakum. Spread peace amongst yourselves. Love God and love of humanity. Love of God and love of humanity. Fakhruddin al-Razi, he said, al-Islam, al-ibadatu lil-khaliq, wa rahmatu lil-khalq. He said, Islam can be summed up in one statement. Worship of the Creator and mercy towards His creation. This is our moral anchor as Abrahamic theists. We're in the millah of Ibrahima Hanifa. This is, and we have difference of opinion, obviously, with our Christian friends and, and neighbors and relatives and our Jewish friends and neighbors and relatives. We have theological differences. We have different types of differences. There's no doubt about it, but the essence of the religion is the same. Now, without this essential understanding of religion, without religion, morality then becomes something relative. Human beings are little more, little more than cattle, chunks of flesh and blood. They become soulless, easily slaughtered, uh, dispensable. Atheism is material reductionism. Thus, speaking of social impact, uh, no one has more blood on their hands than atheists. So think about the big four, right? Mao and Stalin, Pol Pot and Mussolini, confirmed atheists, over 100 million lives, over, I mean that's, that's a, the low end estimate, over 100 million lives, that's 17 Hitlers, because when you don't believe there's a God, there's no day of judgment, you're not going to be taken account for anything, there's no objective morality, no one has anything incorruptible about them, there's no ruh, there's no soul, there's nothing that survives death, well then, your axiom becomes survival of the fittest, and hey, that's natural selection. Now in Sharia, in Islamic law, there are certain rules of engagement. Women and children are never targeted in war. And this is called uh, a tradition that is tawatur. Tawatur means multiply attested, there's no doubt about it. It is simply wrong. Even in pre-Islamic rules of engagement, women and children were not targeted, pre-Islamic. Even the man who wanted to kill the Prophet ﷺ on the day of Uhud, when he had killed Mus'ab ibn Umar and had his sword out and was charging towards the Prophet ﷺ, he stopped dead in his tracks because a woman named Nusayba bin Tukab was standing in front of his horse. He dare not strike a woman on the battlefield. This is pre-Islamic rules of engagement. Right? The pre-Islamic Arabs did not kill people who were sleeping. The man who came to the Prophet ﷺ, Du'thur, the chief of the Muharrib, he actually woke up the Prophet ﷺ before he uh, was going to attack him. And we know the story of what happened to him. So, but if your rules of engagement are determined by what you feel benefits you and your people the most at a particular time, then that's real politik. That's American foreign policy. So the national interest is your guiding principle. And this lack of principled morality this lack of consistent objective morality gives birth to things like false flag operations where the government will act, will do something, will do an act of terror and then blame innocent people for what they've done because national interest is the law of the land. And this is something that oppressors have done for thousands of years. Nero, who was a uh, Roman emperor at the time of the apostles, the Hawariyun of Isa alayhi salam, he set, he set half of Rome on fire and sat back playing his little fiddle and he blamed the Christians for it. And then they made street lamps out of Christians. They would dip them alive into wax, put them on poles and light them on fire while they were still alive. All up and down the streets of Rome. False flag operation. That's what Hitler did. Hitler burned the Reichstag, right? The German 
buildings of parliament. And then he said, these were the communists. So now you have this uh, countrywide inquisition of anyone who had uh, you know, communist ties or suspected to have communist ties. And then he would attack his own military bases and blame other countries. Oh, that, that was the Polish. So now you get the people on your side, right? And you can do whatever you want now because you're guided by national interest. There's many types of false flag operations that are confirmed, declassified. Gulf of Tonkin that got us into Vietnam, the false flag operation, never happened, right? Many, many uh, examples of this. The uh, USS Maine that got us into the Spanish-American War never happened. How many millions of people died because of these lies that were blamed on others? And there are other things as well, other events that we can think of as well. <clears throat> This lack of principled morality, lack of consistent objective morality, it leads to, you know, little boy and fat man. Those are the terms that Truman used for the atomic bombs that were dropped on innocent civilians in Japan. 200,000 people on impact killed, on impact. But hey, it's good for us, right? It's good for our nation. And by the way, these, these bombs were totally unnecessary. Uh, the Japanese economy was in shambles after the oil embargo, embargo that was placed on them by FDR a couple of years earlier. Harry Truman actually writes in his uh, diary that once the Russians get involved, the Japs are done. That's a direct quote. Uh, so this was just a testing ground for their nuclear arsenal. That's what it was, human guinea pigs, right? Because why? They're not guided by divine principles. If you look at the, all of the battles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, uh, over 20 maghazi, or military expeditions, what are the numbers of casualties in all of the battles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Right? And two bombs dropped in Japan, over 200,000 people on impact. In 23 years, what are the number of dead people, the people killed in all of the military campaigns of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What do you think that number is? 1,018, according to Abu Hassan al nadui 1,018. In battle, these were soldiers, about 700 enemy and about 300 Muslim shuhada, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. 1,018. Right? And the way that the Prophet ﷺ is sometimes depicted is as primarily as a warrior. And we shouldn't study Sirah like that. We don't start with Kitab al Maghazi, the book of the military expedition. Start with the Shama'il of the Prophet. ﷺ the outward and inward manifestations of him, sallallahu alayhi wa This is the best way to start study about him, wallahu alam. But here's an interesting thing, is that <clears throat> the uh, Qur'an does not even accept atheism. Is that everyone worships something, at least my understanding of the Qur'an. So uh, most people worship their hawa, their, their caprice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, do you see the one who takes his caprice, his desires, his emotions, his ego as his God, right? He's all about himself, right? Nefsi, nefsi, selfie, selfie. He's always putting selfies up. How many followers do I have? This is interesting. How many people are following me? How many followers do I have? Right? Everyone has lying dormant in their hearts the seed of the claim of the Pharaoh. I am your Lord most high. They're there, lay dormant, this claim to deity, right? People worship their aqal, their intellect, they worship money. There's an interesting book, if you want a reference, John Haught, H-A-U-G-H-T. He's a Jesuit. He wrote a book called God and the New Atheism. He says something interesting. He says, atheists are guilty of what he calls explanatory monism. Explanatory monism where he says, they say that science is the only answer to everything. Science is the only answer to everything. So, for example, I walk into a kitchen, uh, and uh, my mother is making tea for me, but I don't know what she's doing. So I say, what are you doing? She says, I'm expanding molecules. That's true. That's scientifically what's happening. But does it answer my question? No, what are you doing? I'm heating up water and expanding molecules. That's great. But why? 
Because I'm making you tea because I love you. Ah, this is the answer I'm looking for, you see. Why is a much more profound question than what. Science can never give you the why. It can give you how and possibly what, but not why. Another example used by William Chittick in his book Science and the Cosmos. He says, imagine there's a uh, painting. Let's, let's say it's the Mona Lisa. And you put a scientist in front of the painting. And you say to the scientist, tell me about this painting. So on the principle of explanatory monism, the scientist will say, OK, let me do some tests. So he, he does some radiocarbon-14 testing on the canvas. It dates to 15 whatever from Florence. The paint is acrylic, and this is what it's made of, and so on and so on. All, these, all this information, pages and pages, and you're thinking, that's great. It doesn't help me at all. And then you put a child in front of the painting. And you say, what, tell me about the painting. And the child looks at Mona Lisa and says, what is she thinking? I wonder what she's thinking. Which one of these two has greater insight into the mind of the, of the painter? the scientist or the child? The answer is the child, because the child is asking the more profound question, why? Why the painting? Why the universe? Not what the universe. We'll talk more about this, but why? Right? I would argue that we all have transcendental curiosity. Right? All of us. This is a human condition. John Hott calls it a silent calling, an invitation from God. Right? A silent invitation. You know, it's our fitrah. Istajibu lillahi, lima da'akum, lima yuhyikum. O you who believe, O humanity, answer the invitation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he calls you to that which gives you life. Everyone has a transcendental curiosity. And everyone fills in that void with something. Most people do it with religion. Some people do it with sex, with drugs, with rock and roll, with Satanism. And Christopher Hitchens, an atheist, but he was a total, full-blown alcoholic. Even after a debate he had with Chris Hedges one time, right on stage, you saw him take out a little vodka and, and start hitting the bottle. Raging alcoholic. Why? Because he wanted to enter into these altered states of consciousness. He has a transcendental curiosity. Everybody has this. Everybody. However, the Quran says, only with the dhikr, only with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are hearts made tranquil. <clears throat> Okay, so this lack of principled morality, this lack of consistent objectivity or objective morality, it leads to things like this. Invasions of you know, countries under false pretenses, the theft of natural resources. In an October 2006 uh, article in the Washington Post, this is a 2006, the author of the article claimed that 650,000 civilians were killed in Iraq, civilians. And that was in 2006. So this number is up in the millions. Millions. This is genocide. Any way you slice it, it's genocide. So do brown lives matter? Those are, those are women, men, women, and children. Entire families taken off the planet. You know, Noam Chomsky uh, is a professor of linguistics at MIT. He says, we have to put ourselves in an another person's shoes, and then we can understand what terrorism is. He says, imagine Saddam Hussein goes on international television and says, Mr. Bush, you have 48 hours to leave the White House, to leave your country, you and your entire family, 48 hours, or else we're going to attack America. And if you stay, we're attacking. And we're doing this because we have evidence that we're not going to show you. Chomsky says, that is sheer terrorism. That is terrorism, any way you slice it. Right? But this is what happens when we don't have divine commandments guiding our conduct. When it's real politic, when it's national interest, we can bend things because it's in our national interest. We don't have objective morality. Things that are right and wrong, period. It doesn't matter the circumstances. And this leads me to my first argument. When should I stop speaking, by the way? Keep going? Okay. <laughs> First argument for the existence of God is called the moral argument. The moral argument. Here's the thesis of the moral argument. In the absence of God, there would be no objective, meaning universal, moral values. No higher moral authority. There would only be sociocultural relativism. Right and wrong would be determined by the dominant group. It would be totally subjective and thus extremely violent. 
So if my society feels that our morals and values perpetuate our group, why should we listen to your morals and values? Richard Dawkins said, quote, there is no good nor evil. We are machines to propagate DNA. There is no good nor evil. We are machines to propagate DNA. You see, on atheism, you can't be immoral. You can't be immoral. Atheism, science does not deal with morality. It is fundamentally non-moral. There's no right, no real right or wrong, just societal constructs, right? And science can't prove everything, right? What I call the religion of scientism, where the aql is worshipped, and science is the only answer, explanatory monism. Science cannot prove morality. Science cannot prove through the scientific method that murder is wrong. Can you prove it through the scientific method that murder is wrong? No. Science cannot prove metaphysical events like did Washington cross the Delaware? Did Caesar cross the Rubicon? Can it prove these things through the scientific method? No, because in order to do that, you have to go back in time or reproduce that event, which is impossible. Science cannot prove metaphysical events. Science cannot prove love. It cannot prove that I love someone. You can hook me up to some machine and test my heart rate if I'm sweating and things like that. But is it love? It might be hate. It might be envy. What's my specific emotion? Science can't prove it. Science can't prove math. It presupposes math. To claim that science can prove math is to argue in a circle. And what is consciousness? Scientists still doesn't know. Scientists still don't know. Oh, it's chemicals mixing in your, in your brain. But how do you get from chemicals mixing to thought and memory and imagination? All right. So science cannot give us morality. It is fundamentally non-moral. I'm not saying that atheists are immoral. Their atheists are extremely moral people. What I'm saying is that there's nothing in science that compels anyone to be moral. There's nothing in science that compels anyone to be moral. Because you become the highest authority. There's no God, you become the highest authority. And then you start inventing your own morality. This is human nature. So you start playing God. Like Richard Dawkins said, if you find out your child has Down syndrome, just abort it. Try again. Just abort it. I read this today on Facebook. Just today, I read that there was an, an Armenian couple, and they had a healthy baby boy, but he had Down syndrome. The wife said to the husband, give it up for adoption, or else I'm divorcing you. The husband said, no, it's a human being. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ هُوَ الَّذِي يُسَوِّرُكُمْ فِي الْأَرْحَامِ كَيْفَ يَشَاءُ It is he who formed you in the wombs of your mothers as he willed. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ There's no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, no, you have to give it up for adoption. If it was a month earlier, they would have killed the child. Giving up for adoption. Apparently, if you kill it now, it's murder, but a month earlier, it's, it's fine. It's called abortion. You know. And that's the trick of the shaitan. Shaitan plays with words. Right? right? Edward Said in his book uh, Orientalism and George Orwell talked about this. Linguistic colonization. When the oppressor takes your words in your tradition and gives them a new meaning, redefines words. Right? So like taqiyya and sharia and jihad, they're redefining these terms. And Muslims are buying into it. Jihad, unmitigated, perpetual warfare against unbelievers. Really? Well, in the Quran, it talks about jihad. Oh, I can't be Muslim then, because I can't, I, can't I can't get down with that. But that's their definition, right? We have to define our own terms. And that's what shaitan does. Shaitan's tricky. He calls things by different names, right? Paulo Freire. This is a book that everyone should read, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It says, the oppressor uses bread and circus, food and entertainment, to anesthetize the intellects of the masses. And then he uses the antiseptic language of the oppressor and repeats it and repeats it over and over again, 24-hour news cycle. So you don't even know what you're saying anymore. Collateral damage in the theater of operation. What does that mean? There was a lot of collateral damage in the theater of operation. That means a lot of innocent men, women, and children were slaughtered in their own country. That's what that means but we're using antiseptic language. So there's no empathy there. If we don't have empathy, we're not human beings. That's our humanity. Right? 
Okay. So you cannot extract, you know, the virtue of charity or virtue or justice or selflessness or compassion from a double helix, a chromosome or a test tube. We get these things. We extract these things from scripture. On atheism, we're just animals. Just a slightly more evolved primate, second cousin to the chimp. Animals don't have moral duties, so why do we? Most atheists agree that if you see a man drowning in a river, it's your duty to help him. But why? Why is it your duty? You could ask an atheist. Is it, is it part of our evolution to put ourselves in harm's way? Why put yourself in harm's way? Where does this altruism come from? Show me the gene, right? And speaking of evolution, now we're going to talk about Darwin. <laughs> a criticism. To go from a primeval ape to a human being requires trillions of transitional forms and mutations. Trillions, not hundreds, not thousands, not millions, not billions. To go from a cow to a whale, a T-Rex to a swan takes trillions, trillions of transitional forms. And of course Darwin says in the Bible of uh, the atheist, The Origin of Species, 1863, that eventually we'll dig up the earth and we'll find all of these fossils. But we've dug up the earth. We haven't found anything. Found oil and gold. Found a few things. How many skeletons have scientists discovered that they believe to be missing links? Is it in the trillions? Is it in the billions? Is it in the millions? Is it in the thousands? Is it in the hundreds? Is it in the dozens? You can count them on two hands. And they're probably fragments of extinct apes. They say, oh, these are the missing links. There need to be trillions of transitional forms in the earth. That's just for human beings. And of course, there's Darwin's doubt. No one knows about Darwin's doubt. Darwin, who once said, well, if I truly believed that my brain evolved from the brain of a primeval ape, then I, why would I even trust my intellect? Should I even trust my intellect to give me the right answer? How do I know that in 10,000 years, my descendants are not going to look back at me in 2015 and say, look how stupid those people were back then. Just like the way we look at chimpanzees in a zoo and say, look how stupid these chimps are, throwing their feces. Right? Why should I even trust my intellect if I believe that my intellect evolved from a primeval ape and is still in a state of uh, macroevolution? <clears throat> Another argument they make is chimpanzees and human beings are 98% identical in their DNA. As a rabbi once said, a jellyfish and a watermelon are also 98% identical. So I'm not going to eat a jellyfish. What's in that 2% is intellectus. Intellectus, right? This is our differentia, to use Aristotelian nomenclature. What makes us different than any other species is the ability to reason. I like to see a chimpanzee play a violin or build a skyscraper or do some trigonometry. But it's not all, about, not all about the intellect either. Ultimately, it comes down to being a moral person, an ethical person. The Prophet ﷺ said, I was only sent to perfect your character. And part of having good character is believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, somebody might say, well, there's different ways of looking at this some of the modern-day ulama, they might say, well, you can believe in microevolution because there's no definitive answer on this issue except on one part of it. So for us to say evolution is a total farce, I think that's a dangerous position to take because then people are going to think that you're someone like Sarah Palin who says dinosaurs are, you know, they were around 5,000 years ago and all of this radiocarbon-14 dating, that's all a conspiracy from Satan. If you go to Ohio, they have the Creation Museum in Ohio, the Creation Museum, somewhere in Ohio, you know, built by evangelical Christians. You go in, you see, you know, children playing on stegosauruses, animatronic dinosaurs. That's called the Flintstones. That's, that's not science, right? So when you say, there's no such thing as evolution, they're going to put you in that category, right? Uh, so it's important for us to understand that not everything they say is completely out there or false. In fact, a lot of what evolutionists say um, 
is totally compatible with Islamic theology. Microevolution. This is something you can prove. If you put frogs in a certain environment and mess around with the temperature and things like that, you're going to see them starting to change and adapt to their environment. Why do Middle Eastern men have big noses and long eyelashes? Because you've got to keep the sand out of your face. You need to be able to breathe in the desert. Right? Microevolution. However, we take strong exception to this idea that we evolved from primeval monkeys. Right? Now, what's also interesting here is that if you look at when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam and created him, formed him, right? He's lying in state, as it were. He had not breathed into him of his ruh. Uh, the angels had an interesting complaint. They said, are you going to create one who is going to shed blood on earth? Why would they say this? Are you going to create someone who is going to shed blood on earth? Why would they say it? Because something's happening on the earth. Blood is being shed on the earth, right? There are creatures on earth that are shedding blood. And the angels are saying, well, this is going to be similar to that. And what are they talking about? Animals on earth? Animals killing each other is not necessarily considered evil. That's their instinct. That's nature. They don't, there's no teklif. They're not judged on the day of judgment. So it could be that the angels are referring to some sort of humanoid creature on earth, possibly the Neanderthal, Allahu Alam, that looks somewhat similar to Adam and saying, look, they're killing each other. Are you going to create something similar that's going to kill each other as well? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I know what you know not. What's the difference between Adam alayhi salam and a Neanderthal, a homo sapien and a Neanderthal? Is the ability to reason and articulate. This is what makes Adam, this is what gives him the khilafa. This is what gives him the uh, vice regency of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. The Neanderthal did not have a developed larynx. You can just make simple sounds, not complex speech. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا We taught Adam the names of everything. الرحمن عَلَّمَ القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الرحمن, the most gracious, the teacher of the Quran. He created humanity and taught human beings how to speak, how to articulate. So it's not necessarily our physical bodies that make us different than the rest of the animal kingdom. You know, as philosophers said, as a philosopher said, an eagle can spot a fish underwater from a mile up in the air. I can't do that. Put me in a room with a lion, I'm going to lose. Right? But what makes us special, what gives us the khilafa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our ability to reason and submit and have good character and comportment and uh, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why we're judged on the Yawm al-Qiyamah. Okay. So good and evil has no referent if God doesn't exist. Unless we redefine good and say that it means something that makes your life more pleasurable. Right? But that's dangerous because your pleasure might be someone's torture. What if someone takes pleasure in killing children and burying them in his backyard, right? On atheism, that is not immoral, nor wrong. Atheism does not deal with morality. It is fundamentally non-moral. It's just not socially acceptable, right? Like breaking wind in public or burping out loud. So what if it was socially acceptable? On what grounds does Richard Dawkins condemn child exploitation, child rape, if that society finds it acceptable and conducive to their perpetuation. You see, it's revelation that gives us the Ten Commandments, the Noahidic laws, the moral imperatives of the Quran, which are called al-ma'ruf, al-ma'ruf, ta'muruna bil-ma'ruf. You call to that which is good. Ma'ruf literally means things that are known. We know these things. We know them. They're axiomatic. How do we know them? They're either taught to us directly from revelation given by prophets, or they're infused, as Aquinas said, upon our very souls by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Either way, they come from the divine presence. Our moral objectives, our objective moral values, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, respect parents, don't oppress, speak the truth. In ancient Athens, 
pederasty was very common. Pederasty is uh, like grown men having relationships with boys. Right? These are married men. In fact, Socrates says that once he walked into the gymnasium, the word gymnasium in Greek means a place of naked boys. So I walked in, I saw them wrestling naked, I wasn't even aroused. This is what he says. This is the ethos, the culture of ancient Athens. Simply what most people were doing. But in Sparta, another city-state, that is a capital offense to do something like that. Another Greek city-state. Now if a Jew wandered into Athens, right, in 5th century before the Common Era, and he saw what was happening there as far as this type of thing, he would be able to condemn it because he has objective, principled morality. He believes in a scripture. But an atheist could say, well, that's their culture. They abuse little boys. That's their culture. He could say that because he doesn't deal with morality. He doesn't believe in scripture. Or he'd say, it's, it's wrong. Why is it wrong? It's just wrong. Why? It's just wrong. Show me the gene. Why is it wrong? It's wrong because it eventually leads to the downfall of their society. That's why it's wrong. No, it's wrong, period. It's morally wrong. It's just wrong, period. We can say that because we believe in a higher morality, a moral anchor that's above human intellect. So just as you know, theists have the problem of evil, right? it's called theodicy, William Dembski, he talks about the problem of good with atheists, the problem of good. I'll give you an example, something simple. Why would I give my seat to an old woman on the BART train? Atheists say for two reasons. To prolong your species or for reciprocal advantage. I scratch my back, you scratch yours, because we're all apes at the end of the day, apparently. Right? But is that why I give my seat to this lady? Do I uh, want to prolong my species? Do I want her to tip me or something? No. Why would I give blood? Do I want to, what, why would I do that? They say, well, it makes you feel good. So atheism is an extremely cynical way of looking at the world. Extremely cynical. You help people because it makes you feel good. Right? That's why you're doing everything. So why do it? You know, Mother Teresa is an atheistic moral enigma. This is someone who used to hug lepers, you know, a model of sacrifice and charity and altruism. And of course, she came under attack by Hitchens. He wrote a book about her saying she was all about money. She didn't really believe in anything, this type of thing. So they can't answer. Why would somebody do something like that? Why would they give their lives in the service of others? So in conclusion, on the moral argument, if there's no God, there is no moral anchor. If we don't have a moral anchor, then everything becomes relative morally. If everything becomes morally relative, then something like national interest will replace God's law, which advocates objective morality. If national interest takes over, it's going to lead to a whole lot of violence. And that's what we're seeing right now. A whole lot of violence. You know. <clears throat> yeah. you know, our leaders, are, they feign Christianity. They're not Christian. Christians don't worship owls. You know. Check out the Bohemian Grove. If you haven't heard about it, you should learn about it. Bohemian Grove, just Google it. Okay, this next argument is called the cosmological argument. This is espoused by Abu Hamad al-Ghazali in his Tahafatul Falasifa, the incoherence of the philosophers, and advocated by contemporary scholar William Lane Craig, his book called Kalam, Cosmological Argument. It's a book that I highly recommend, the Kalam, Cosmological Argument. It's based on the Ghazali text. So here's the basic syllogism. Premise number one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise number two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. This is not strictly theological, but has theological implications, because then we have to ask, what can create a universe? Now, a, the rule of classical metaphysics is ex nihilo nihil fit in Latin, which means from nothing comes nothing. Now, most atheists agree, whether they're cosmologists or physicists or biologists, Richard Dawkins, Lawrence Krauss, Quentin Smith, Daniel Dennett, Roger Penrose, Stephen Hawking, they all say that the universe, the cosmos, came from nothing. Nothing. This is now the standard model of the universe. The universe came from absolutely nothing. And this is true. As theists, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the universe 
ex nihilo, out of nothing. But atheists say, no, it's uncaused, it's unprovoked, it just popped into existence from literary, no, from literally nowhere. Quentin Smith says, he's at the University of West Michigan, atheist, he says, quote, the universe came from nothing, by nothing, for nothing. That's a metaphysical claim. That doesn't sound like a naturalist. That's a metaphysical claim. Daniel Dennett, he says, the universe picked itself up by its own bootstraps. Imagine you're wearing boots. Can you pick yourself off the ground by picking up your bootstraps? That's a metaphysical statement. That's a religious statement. How can something come from nothing uncaused? Is that science? Theist Frank Turek, he said, he wrote a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. He says, to believe a universe can come from nothing is worse than magic. Because in magic, I take my hat off, I pull a rabbit out of my hat. That's going from something to something. Empty space is something, it's not nothing. But a universe out of nothing is a great leap of faith. It requires a lot of iman, a whole lot. You gotta, you gotta be a mu'min, big time, to believe in something like that. I don't have enough faith to believe in something like that. So what is nothing? Stephen Hawking says the universe can spontaneously create itself out of nothing. Again, that's not naturalism. That's a supra-rational statement, a religious statement. What is nothing? Aristotle said, nothing is what stones dream about. What does a stone dream about? Absolutely nothing. It's not simply empty space. Like I play a trick on my kids and I say, is there anything in my hand? And they say, in my hands? They say, no. And I go like this. Ha ha. There's a finger in there. Right? No. Even if I went like that, there's nothing. There's something there. Empty space is certainly something. Or like that show, let's make a deal. Door number one or door number two? Door number one, they open it. Oh, there's nothing. No. There's certainly something. From, from a scientific standpoint, there's a lot of things there. Right? So, Stephen Hawking, this is something interesting. He says, look, at the subatomic level, subatomic level in the quantum vacuum, and no one really understands quantum physics and mechanics, anyway, he says in the quantum vacuum, uh, you have the photon coming in and out of existence. And he says, look, this is evidence that something can come from nothing. In the quantum vacuum, you have the photon coming in and out of existence. The problem is that the quantum vacuum is a sea of fluctuating energy highly volatile and unstable. It is certainly something. The latest from Hawking, and they made a movie about this recently, The Theory of Everything, is that he, this is what he says. If you extrapolate the universe backwards, because the universe is expanding, right? It's expanding, right? And it's expanding isotropically, which means evenly. And this is something that is proven scientifically. Uh, the red shift of the planets and galaxies is called Hubble's Law, right? Uh, which means the universe is actually expand, not constricting. If it was constricting, it would, it, the planets, uh, the, the color would appear blue according to the Doppler effect. So it's definitely uh, expanding, right? I mean, Einstein called it in 1917. Einstein sitting at his desk with a pencil. And this is something interesting, something amazing about the universe, the uncanny uh, accuracy of mathematics, that the universe, you can work things out at your desk with a pencil because the universe is ordered. And that's evidence of design. Well, Einstein said, look, my calculations say either the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light or is collapsing upon itself. And this can't be right because at his time, the dominant theory in the scientific community is the steady state model of the universe, right? That the universe is eternal in the past and it's not growing or expanding. So he put in the lambda, the cosmological constant in his equations to ensure the steady state model of the universe, and he called it the biggest blunder of his life. He was actually correct. The universe is expanding. Also, MBR, microwave, microwave background radiation, discovered in 1965 by two men, Penzias and Wilson, proves the universe is expanding. This is called the, the Hartle Hawking standard model of the universe. It's also called the Friedman Lemaitre standard model or Big Bang cosmology. Anyway, Stephen Hawking says if you extrapolate the universe backwards, you get to the point where there's an infinitesimally small black hole, okay? And this is how he sidesteps infinite regression. Because in the black hole, there's no time. What is infinite regression? If I say, what came first, the chicken or the egg? So the egg came first. The egg came out of a chicken, though. 
Okay, the chicken came first, but the chicken came out of an egg. Okay, the egg came first, but the egg came out of a chicken, though. Okay, the chicken came first, but the, ch the chicken came out of an egg. We go back ad infinitum. It's called infinite regress, infinite regression. So how does he solve it? He says, look, in the black hole, there's no time. There's nothing before that because there's no time. Therefore, we've, we've conquered infinite regression. The problem with that is that a black hole is not an initial condition of anything. It is a resultive state. It is a secondary state of a solar explosion. It is matter, and matter requires motion, and motion requires time. So we may ask, what was before the black hole? Right? Because a black hole is not nothing. Right? Where did the singularity come from? It reminds me of a joke that a group of atheists are speaking, and God is listening to their conversation. And then the atheists are saying, okay, there was, and God tells them, how did it come about? And the atheist, okay, there was this black hole. And then God says, hey, get your own black hole. <laughs> Lawrence Krauss, foremost cosmologist, Arizona State University, wrote a, wrote a book called the, A Universe Out of Nothing, big atheist. He says we can date the universe to four decimal places, 13.7256 billion years, to four decimal places. He can date the universe. He says the nexus of space-time came into being at the Big Bang. In fact, space-time and matter came into being. This is called cosmogenesis. But how? He says by itself, by itself. It created itself. This is a faith claim. This is a metaphysical claim. It's like if I say to you, I created myself. Would you believe me? No. Unless, you know, you believe that I have supernatural qualities. So you see, the only way to avoid infinite regress is to go metaphysical, to go supernatural, to go theological. Only a non-contingent being, in other words, one who is not subject to infinite regress, one who is eternal, and one who is necessarily spaceless, because space came into being, and timeless, because time came into being, and immaterial, because mater matter came into being, extremely powerful and intelligent because a universe came from that entity. Only such an entity can bring a universe out of nothing. But then the atheist will say, well, then who caused God? It is God's very nature to be pre-eternal. The first premise of the Kalam cosmological argument says, whatever begins to exist has a cause. God did not begin to exist. In fact, to ask this question is to question the very existence of the universe itself. I'll give you an example. I use this example a lot. Let's say I'm standing in a line and there's a brother standing in front of me and I say to the brother, hey brother, can I give you a hug? And this brother says, you have to ask the guy behind you for permission. So hey, can I give him a hug? And this brother says, ask the guy behind me for permission. Hey, can I give him a hug? Ask the guy behind me for permission. Hey, can I give him a hug? Ask the guy behind me for, and this goes on ad infinitum. Will I ever hug the brother? No. The hugging of the brother represents the creation of the universe. So if these are gods behind me, a god who created another god, who created another god, who created another god, this does not solve infinite regress. Infinite regress dies at the door of the eternal. Infinite regress dies at the door of the eternal. And you cannot traverse an actual infinitude. An actual infinite number of events, you can never traverse that. You can never complete that. In other words, if the universe is eternal in the past and God created another God who, who was created by another God, we never get to today. We never get to the creation of the universe. An infinite, an actual infinitude cannot be traversed. So George Cantor, the uh, theoretical mathematician, modern day set theory and things like that, he distinguishes two types of infinitudes. He says the first type, he calls it an actual infinitude and it's represented in math by the Hebrew uh, letter Aleph. What is the actual infinitude? A number that transcends and contains all natural numbers and cannot be increased by one. A number that, that contains and transcends all natural numbers and cannot be increased by one unit. It does not exist in nature. It cannot exist in nature. Abu Yusuf al-Kindi, he gives an example. Abu Yusuf al-Kindi, he says, his analogy, he says, imagine you have in space somewhere a huge blob, and this blob is made of an actual infinite number of particles. 
Then you take 10 of those particles and you put it on the side. Is this blob still an actual infinitude? You say, uh, yes, it's still an actual infinitude. So then there are two actual infinitudes, infinity and infinity minus 10. So, oh, no, that's illogical. So no, now it's a finite number of, of particles. Okay, what about if we put this 10, also finite, back into the blob? A finite plus a finite only gives you a finite. You can never get to an actual infinite number. What we do have, however, is a theoretical infinitude, the lazy eight, a theoretical infinitude. And a theoretical infinitude can be traversed in finite space. We do it all the time. My hand is above my notebook, right? How many times can I cut this distance in half? In theory, an infinite number of times, but I'll never actually get to an actual infinitude. But what if I do this? Does that mean that I've traversed an actual infinitude? No, because I've set parameters. This is 0.0, .0 and this is 1.0, right? But when we're dealing with the universe, if it's pre-eternal in the past, and God was created by another God, who was created by another God, who was created by another God, we don't have 0.0. .0. We'll be stuck forever in the infinite past. We never get to the actual creation of the universe. An actual infinitude cannot be traversed. Suppose someone comes up to us, comes in this masjid and says, I've been counting from negative infinity, from negative infinity, and now I'm about to, uh, I'm about to uh, get to zero. Negative three, negative two, negative one, zero. Oh, that, that took so long. We'd laugh in his face, wouldn't we? We'd laugh in his face. So, if the universe is eternal in the past, or if we dare to ask the question, who created God then? then we're denying the very existence of the universe itself, which is here, and we know it is. Infinite regress dies at the door of the eternal. Who is the eternal? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 2130 of the Quran. Very interesting verse. Very, very interesting verse. I quoted this verse to an atheist as an undergraduate. Do not the unbelievers, the atheists, the agnostics, do, not they, do, not, do they not see that the heavens and the earth, and the heavens and the earth is a euphemism for the cosmos in the Quran, that the cosmos, the universe, was a single unit of matter, and then we clove them asunder. We clove them asunder. I quoted this verse to an atheist. He said, I said, this is a verse from scripture. He said, that verse is not in the Bible. I said, I didn't say it was in the Bible. I said, it's in scripture. He said, what scripture? I said the Quran, and I showed it to him, he looked at it, and he said, who wrote this? I said, this is a revelation, it's 1400 years old. He said, I don't believe it. You wrote this. This is what he told me. You, 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 must, you must have written this. He said, no, this is 1400 years old. He said, you're translating it wrong. He said, no, I know Arabic. This is what it says. This is loosely, basically what it's saying. No, no, you wrote this. He refused to actually acknowledge it. SubhanAllah. Very interesting verse. The firmament the heavens, right? We created them with skill and we are expanding them. From wasa'a. This is active participle. We are actively expanding the universe, right? This is Surah 51, verse 47. You know. Fatir is samawati wal ard. Allah is Fatir is samawati wal ard. What does Fatara mean? To split or break something apart. The splitter of the heavens and the earth, of the cosmos. Badi'ur samawati wal ard in Al Baqarah. Badi'ur means the originator, the one who creates out of nothing, the originator of the heavens and the earth. Thalikumullah rabbukum la ilaha illahu khaliku kulli shay'in. That is your Lord. There is no God but He. He's the creator of everything space, time, matter, energy, everything. This is why God cannot be in space, time, and matter, because there's nothing like God whatsoever. There's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatsoever. Somebody might say, what about other gods? We're all atheists. You don't believe in Thor and in Baal and in Dionysus and Zeus. What about these other gods? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the God of Abraham, stays relevant and will stay relevant because his qualities adequately explain the origins of the universe. His qualities adequately explain the origins of the universe. He's transcendent of space, time, materiality, pre and post eternal. This will always stay relevant because this answers the question of, the answers the enigma of infinite regress. 
And Isa alayhi salam, his worship is being phased out. Christians are in the Abrahamic tradition, but many of them are leaving Trinitarian Christianity. And this began in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation, right, and the development of the printing press, where Christians are reading the Bible in their own vernacular and rejecting the text. They have major issues with the text, right? So a very fast-growing movement nowadays, a Silkinian Unitarian Christianity, was very similar to our theology, right? Unitarian Christianity. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Almost done. The last argument I want to talk about, and it will be done, inshallah ta'ala, it's called the teleological argument. So we covered the moral argument. We covered the uh, kalam cosmological argument. This is called the teleological argument. So this is two versions of it. The traditional version of the teleological argument argues for biological co complexity. So look at the human eye. Is it by chance that it's, it's, it's incredible, the human brain? You know, the systems in the body, you know, uh, the bodies of insects. I mean, the architect of the Eiffel Tower looked at the bodies of insects. Um, the, uh, the architects of airplanes looked at the wings of birds. Uh, the, the human cell, Anthony Flew, was a big atheist at the University of Cambridge. For 50 years, he debated big-time scholars, uh, theistic scholars. He was a total atheist. After 50 years, he said, you know what, I think there's a God. After 50 years of debating theists, he said, I can't account for the human cell. I can't account for it. How all of this information can be in a cell. This can't be chance. It's not evolution. This is design, right? I mean, the two greatest scientists of all time, according to scientists, believe in God. Newton and Einstein. Not only did they believe in God, they were Unitarian. They were Unitarian deists. And Newton had to keep his Unitarian belief uh, in the closet, as it were, because at that time in England, there was no chirp separation of church and state, and professing Unitarian beliefs was seen as kufr or blasphemy, and the penalty was death. But later in his writings, in his diary, in his journal, we see that he was in fact a Unitarian Christian. <clears throat> the Enlightenment thinkers, Voltaire, David Hume, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, all of them believed in God. They had issues with aspects of Christianity, but none of them were atheist. <clears throat> okay. So that's the traditional sort of teleological. Now the cutting edge, what's known as the cutting edge uh, teleological argument, argues for cosmic design due to fine tuning of the universe. This is also called the anthropic principle. So we know the watchmaker analogy, right? And this is attributed to William Paley in 1802. Right? And actually, Ghazali said something similar. It actually goes back to Cicero. But Europeans usually get the, the credit for everything, right? Like the printing press, they give it to Gutenberg. But in China, hundreds of years, they had actually paper and printing press. You know, uh, uh, Pascal's wager, something said almost identical by Sayyidina Ali. Right? Anyway, they can take the credit for whatever they want. Okay, so anyway, you're walking on the beach, you see a watch. You pick it up, you notice that it's obviously designed. Right? So you say, oh, this is just chance. You know, the atoms formed itself to make this beautiful, precise work of art. It was chance, right? Or if you, you know, you're on the moon, you know, the dark side of the moon, and you see this massive piece of machinery there. Machinery. So you can conclude three things. Either this machinery has to be there, it's by necessity, which scientists do not agree with. The moon functions without the machinery. It's not necessary to be there. Or it's there by chance, meaning the atoms sort of just fell into the right places. Or it's designed. Now you say, okay, it's designed. Then who designed it? You don't need to have an explanation for design to be the best explanation. You don't have to have an explanation for the designer, for design to be the best explanation. It's still the best explanation. So you look at the Earth, for example, the distance from the sun. If the Earth was a little bit closer or farther, there's no life on the planet. If the Moon was a little bit closer or farther, there's no life on the planet. The Earth is actually in something scientists call the Goldilocks zone. The Goldilocks zone. It's not too far, it's not too close, it's just right. And that's a very, very thin zone, a life-permitting zone around the Sun. Right? Days are 24 hours. If they're longer or shorter, we would either die from heat 
would burn or we'd freeze to death. The axis, 23.5 degrees. If it would turn a little bit, there's no life on the planet. The atmosphere of our planet swallows up these solar flares that are being thrown at us from the sun. This, if we didn't have an atmosphere, we'd be dead in a, in a nanosecond from solar flares that are, that are that's, uh, uh, protecting our planet from solar flares. The uh, planet Jupiter, because of its gravity, is pulling all of these asteroids and comets away from the Earth and basically being like this huge cosmic vacuum cleaner protecting our planet. Right? Protons are exactly 1,836 times larger than neutrons. If they're 1,837 times larger, there's no life on the planet. If they're 18 1,835 times bigger, there's no life on the planet. This type of precision, right? The solar system itself is like a watch. So Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, he noticed that the planets were on the same plane and they orbited in the same direction. And he said, this is design. And now the atheist, he says, look, this is what the theist does. The theist, you know, he says that when we don't know why something's happening, he fills in that gap of ignorance with God. This is called the God of the gaps argument. This is what theists are, are uh, alleged to do by atheists. When a theist doesn't know something, he says, oh, that's just design, that's God, God of the gaps. However, we understand how a watch works. It doesn't negate a designer. We know what causes a solar eclipse. We can predict them. We can predict floods and earthquakes. This doesn't negate that they're asbab or their means by which God works in the world, right? There's a movie that just came out called Exodus where he tries to uh, present um, scientific explanations. The, the Nile turned red because there were some crocodile attacks. Okay, but what does that mean? That's, that's what happened, vahiran. But what does that mean, baltinan? What does that mean in reality? And that's where the theist looks to. The frogs came out because there was blood in the water. Okay, but these are the ten plagues of Egypt. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will that to happen? What's the purpose behind it? Why do we have these destruction stories in the Quran? The Ad, the Thamud, the people of Noah. They say, oh, that, those are just, you know, uh, earthquakes and tsunamis. Yeah, that's what they were, but why? Why did that happen? Our actions affect our physical environments. This is why we make dua for rain, right? I would say that the atheists are guilty of the dark of the gaps argument. The dark of the gaps. So here's what the atheist says. The atheist, you know, this is a recent, relatively recent discovery, that they said, you know, Jupiter doesn't have enough gravity to keep itself in its orbit around the sun. It should be flying off into space somewhere. What's, what's pulling Jupiter towards the sun? Uh, dark matter. What's dark matter? Well, I don't, we don't know. But it's dark matter. We're going to fill in the gap of that ignorance with a dark matter. But what is it? Well, it's the greatest mystery in all of physics. That's a direct quote from Lawrence Krauss. The universe is expanding and getting faster, accelerating. You would think it would slow down, right? You know, the second law of thermodynamic. It's going to slow down and reach equilibrium. No, it's getting faster. Why is it faster? Atheists have no idea. Something is pushing it out. Verily, we are expanding it. But what's the answer from the atheist? Dark energy. What's dark energy? We don't know. We're going to fill in the gaps of that ignorance with a dark, dark energy. And they say, oh, you guys have God of the gaps. We don't, that's, it's illogical. Just because we know how something happens doesn't deny that it has a designer. Right? If you took a cell phone back in Marty McFly's time machine, you know, to 1950, they'll look at, they'll say, wow, this is magic. It's magic. And then you go forward in time, oh, we know, how, we know how this works now. So, just because you know how something works doesn't negate the idea that it had a designer. Right? <clears throat> okay. Now, almost all scientists conclude that the universe is fine-tuned all of them, for the existence of intelligent life. Fine-tuned is a neutral term. It's not strictly theological. How is it fine-tuned? You have these things called constants and quantities. Constants and quantities. And the four fundamental forces of nature. They have to fall within an incredibly narrow range 
in order to permit life in the universe. The four fundament fundamental forces of nature are gravity, electromagnetism, weak nuclear force, and strong nuclear force. All of these found in the point of singularity at the Big Bang. So here's the syllogism. Premise number one. The fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, it just has to be like that, and all atheists by ijma' of the kuffar, by ijma', they say that's not the reason why. It doesn't have to be like that. Number two, it's by chance, and almost by ijma', they say yes, that's what it is. It's just chance, or it's design. Premise number two, if it's not due to physical necessity or chance, then it's due to design. Therefore, it is due to design. Specified complexity, the universe is specified, it is created, it's tailored with unimaginable intelligence and pinpoint exquisite precision. I'll give you an example. First, a quote from William Lane Craig. He says, there are 50 such constants and quantities present in the Big Bang that must be fine-tuned in this way. And the ratios to one another must also be fine-tuned to allow to a life-permitting universe. He says the numbers become absolutely incomprehensible. I'll give you an example now. The number of seconds in the history of the universe is 10 to the 17th. 10 with 17 zeros after it. The number of seconds in the history of the universe. The number of subatomic particles in the universe, subatomic particles in the universe, is 10 to the 80, according to William Dembski. 10 to the 80. Okay, atomic weak force, which operates in the nucleus of the atom. An alteration of the atomic weak force, an, an alteration of one part out of 10 to the 100 would render life unsustainable in the universe. So imagine, you're given one dart, and out there in space, there's 10 to the 100 targets. 10 to the 100. That's more, that's more than there are seconds in history, in, in the history of the universe. That's more than there are subatomic particles in the universe. You have 10 to the 100 uh, targets. You're given one dart. So you have to hit the right dart or there's no life in the universe. And you just, ah, <laughs> oh, mashallah. <laughs> and this happens over 50 times, 50 times in a row. Another example, if gravity changed, one part out of 10 to the 40, there's no life in the universe. Atheists say, this is just chance. We got lucky. The constants and quantities fell within the life-permitting range. Let me give you another analogy, the lottery analogy. Imagine somebody comes up to you and says, there's this huge cosmic hat, and in this hat, there are 10 to the 40 number of index cards. 10 to the 40. 10 with 40 zeros, right? Index cards. On all of these, there's nothing written on any of these index cards. Nothing, except one, and that's your initials. We're going to put them into this big cosmic hat. And then we're going to pull one out at random. If we pull out a blank card, nothing will happen. Nothing happens. Nothing. But if we pull out the card with your initials on it, we kill you. We're going to kill you. 10 to the 40. Say, so, okay, I'm feeling, I mean, it's not going to happen. Less than 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of 1%. It's infinitesimally small. It's just not going to happen. It's basically impossible. So they say, okay, here we go. Ready? Ah! Uh -huh. <laughs> Your initials. What's the initial thought in your head? This is rigged. <laughs> right? This was designed. This is rigged. This is a conspiracy. Right? That's just gravity. There's 50 such constants and quantities that have to line up with such exquisite permission, precision to even allow life to be in the universe. So we have what's known as a cosmic landscape, possible universes. There are 10 to the 500 possible universes within different values of the constants and qualities, quantities consistent with the laws of nature. The portion of these universes that can uh, permit life is infinitesimally small. The range is incredibly minuscule. What is life? An organism's ability to take in food, process it, grow and develop and reproduce after its kind. Alvin Platinga, he's a professor at the University of Notre Dame, he says, imagine you have these large dials, like combination lock dials, he said there's a million of them, one million, and each dial goes up to a thousand. And you have one shot to figure out the combination. And if you do, we give you a billion dollars. A billion dollars. That is more likely than a life-permitting universe. That is more likely than a life-permitting universe. Conclusion is, Allahu <laughs> mawjood. Allah exists. Jazakallah khairan.
I guess we can, we'll probably pray whatever you guys want to do. So I think before we pray, we might just take a few questions. Just the rules on the question is we already have one lecture. <laughs> so if you don't have a question, please don't give us another speech. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you got a question, you can ask it. You know, and alhamdulillah, see how the shake just raised his hand? We want to make sure that the shake raised, uh, everybody who has a question raised his hand. Yeah. Shaykh, uh, salam alaykum. Wa alaykum salam My question is, the Shaykh's contact is for him. Allahu Akbar. Yeah, yeah. You can. Uh, we had a blackboard. We still got that blackboard? Mm. I'm writing on the blackboard. Oh, okay. That'll work, inshallah. Hey, I'm, I'm not a scientist. This is sort of something I fell into out of necessity. My, my actual specialty is in um, the, the New Testament. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead, brother. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. So you mentioned several times in your uh, lecture that atheism is fundamentally uh, not immoral but unmoral. They don't, the atheism doesn't do with morality. Um, but you also mentioned that it, there are plenty of atheists, agnostics, what, uh, what have you, that are moral, ethical people. Um, I can imagine you know, different ways. Yeah, I think it's, they have morality, but the theological answer is that uh, there is an opinion amongst theologians that every human being, by virtue of being a human being, knows the ma'roof. The ma'roof means they know the, uh, they, they know the basic objective moral laws and pro prohibitions. Uh, so like the Noahidic laws, seven of the Ten Commandments. Everybody knows instinctively not to kill, not to steal, not to commit adultery. Um, to believe in God, everyone knows that. So that's just a manifestation of their fitrah. There's still something there. That's one explanation. Another explanation is that no, you're born clean. There's a clean slate, right? It's more Ash'ari uh, virtue, command theory, theology from our tradition. Uh, but we're socialized. So these atheists, they don't know it, but they've actually been socialized by Judeo-Christian Islamic morals and ethics, even though they want to deny that. So, yes, atheists, I know some atheists are extremely moral people, very charitable people, right? And that's great. The problem is when you don't have a moral anchor, right? You don't have a higher morality. Then who determines your morality? If Hitler won the war and he makes everyone, you know, join his cause, then he becomes the moral anchor on earth. Everything becomes relative. There needs to be someone to stand up and say, this is just simply wrong because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my scripture, a transcendental being that is above us, says it's wrong or right. Yeah. So I would say that that's an argument that atheists make, and, and I think it's, um, uh, from a theistic standpoint, from, from an Islamic standpoint, it's sort of a, a short-sighted way of looking at existence, that we believe that the dunya, this is, this is where these things happen in the dunya. This is not a surprise. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us uh, that uh, that's the nature of the dunya. Dunya means the low world, right? So I think it's important for us to explain these things to people, that this is a period of testing, a, a period of tribulation, a period in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصِ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ right? That this is a place where certainly we will test you. Certainly. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ And there's double emphasis in Arabic here. Very much emphasized. Certainly we will test you uh, with something from loss, uh, from hunger, and loss of possessions, loss of life. Uh, oppression, things like that. But we know as Muslims, and this is how we have to explain it to people, is that that the afterlife is better and it's eternal. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean some people just 
looking at the world can become very, very cynical, as you know, just looking at what's going on in the world. And uh, some people just from that will say, there must be a day of judgment then. There has to be a day of judgment. These people are just going to get away with all of this type of thing, right? Um, that's just instinctively. They not, might not even be raised in a religious tradition. But we know as Muslims that the afterlife is forever, right? So what happens here it fails or pales in comparison. That doesn't mean that we don't do anything because the word Muslim is an active participle. We're not a quote unquote you know, messianic tradition where we kind of, we believe in the Messiah, obviously, but we don't sit back and have someone come and solve our problems. A Muslim, you know, not Muslim. Active, not passive, is someone who is actively creating peace on the earth and submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have work to do on the planet, right? But ultimately we know that there's going to be, you know, what George Bush tried to call infinite justice, but was changed to some other title. Infinite justice only happens on Yom al Qiyamah, right? And the Prophet sallallahu said that the most depraved person in the dunya who was a believer when he enters Jannah, imagine the most depraved believer on earth. He has no arms, no legs, he's in the street, people are spitting on him, they're cursing him. He says, when this person enters into Jannah, he will be asked, did you suffer in the dunya? He says, I don't remember. Because he's in Jannah. And now the maqam of Jannah is realized. The maqam of the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. In this world, a mother will willingly give her life to save her child. No question whatsoever. But on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, People will run from their family members because they understand the maqam of the yawm al-qiyamah. They understand it. Prophets are on their knees, shaking. Ana khaliluk, Ibrahim alayhi salam. I'm your friend. I'm your friend. Ibrahim alayhi salam. Khalilullah is in this state. What is our state? You know. So this is part of... This is part of, you know, Certainly you're going to hear a lot of white noise from people of the book and from uh, atheists and from mushrikeen. And I consider the atheists to actually be mushrikeen. Because the atheists say the universe created itself, that's a divine attribute. Or the, the universe is pre-eternal in the past, that's a divine attribute. That's shirk. That's not atheism. They're mushrikeen. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us these things in scripture. Isa alayhi salam says, according to the Gospel of Matthew, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all things against you falsely. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For the persecuted, the prophets that came before you. Right? This is what happens in the dunya. Right? And we believe, you know, people, you know, these one million, two million people that are killed by the American military industrial complex in the Middle East, we believe, inshallah, these people are shuhada. And they're in Jannah. That doesn't mean we don't do anything. Oh, sure, let's sit back and relax and enjoy our, our lattes. Right? No, we have to speak up. It's very important. We have to speak up. Afdalul jihad man qala karima tahaqqin indo sultan in jair. Aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. The greatest jihad is a word of truth in the face of a tyrant. Right? So it's important for us to engage. You know, we don't, we don't disengage from the dunya. This is not our tradition. We don't go out and live in the deserts and whatnot. You can do that for... A weekend, you know, for a deen intensive, as it were, and shock your nafs out of its complacency, so it'll find an i'tidal, a balance from the extreme positions. But we don't live that type of lifestyle. We engage with the world, right? We try to rectify the world. Islah, we try to make reconciliation in the world. And Jannah is forever, you know. So, you know, at the end of the day, people who are killed, people who are oppressed, people who have uh, you know, tribulations and are, are sick and dying, they're the lucky ones, when you really think about it. They were the lucky ones. Because al-akhira khayrun wa abqa. It's better and it's perpetu perpetual. You know. yeah. Wa alaikum salam.
positivism because I do feel that the stuff can be stages and that everything is contextual in terms of if you look at the principle, the way that the Quran came, even the prayer was not revealed to the Quran there. And there are certain things in the Quran that say that, um, you know, if you are not good to your neighbor, the, this woman who was not good to her neighbor, she took a lot of ibadah and prayer every night and fasting and these were all nullified and she came and took money. So there's this relativity in the Quran. When you were speaking, you were saying that there that the atheist has relativity and the Muslim doesn't. So I'd like you to, to address that a little bit, like how we can keep our goals and keep our absolutism, which can be very poisonous when people lose sight of mercy and the Rahmah, and at the same time, you know, talk about the relativity and the contextual. And my first question is, um, I have a friend, I was friends with her for 30 years until she said that Jews just have to agree to disagree about Palestine. And I said, oh no, you know, that's not. So I, it turns out, and I knew she was a, a um, Jew for Jesus. But and then I, once that happened, and I actually broke up my friendship with her, I found out the Jews for Jesus thing that it's really called. And I'm very, very curious. You know, she was sending me stuff saying that Hitler's war is justified, and you know, wounded knee is justified. That's just the nature of war. And she showed me the quotes in the Bible that say, you know, to exterminate the innocent and the, the Philistine. So I just wondered if you could shed a little light on what the thinking is in that particular cult, the cult? Yes, inshallah. Three big questions. <laughs> we'll do our best, inshallah. Uh, I've already forgot your first question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, the neo-atheists, um, you know, they're, they're significantly later than Darwin. But, yeah, I probably should have included Darwin in the, what I call the original gangsters of atheism. I think I'll throw him in there now with, with Freud and Nietzsche and Bertrand Russell and uh, so we'll add to Charles Darwin as well. Um, as far as relativism goes, um, we believe as Muslims that there are certain immutables in Sharia, things that never change over time, uh, and they're very few actually, but they include major uh, prescriptions and, and prohibitions uh, that are good for all time until the Yom al Um So uh, it's important to stay within those um, basic universal ideals there's also, in our sharia, mutaghayyarat, things that are variable, things that change according to context. You know, when people hear the word sharia, they think it's some draconian law code or penal code that's 1,400 years old and uh, Muslims are trying to, you know, cut off hands in the streets and publicly flog people. Um, uh, and that's in one aspect, you know, the, the, penal, the penal code of Islamic law, um, which many modern-day scholars actually propose a moratorium to be... Um, uh, pronounced over those types of things because the essence of the law is not being realized. Uh, but there are immutables, right? Thawabit in our tradition. And I think the problem with uh, aspects of Ahlul Kitab is that they lost even their Thawabit, right? They lost their immutables in tradition. So everything becomes relative. Also, the way that, you know, that science interacts with, with Christianity, for example, I would say for the most part has been antagonistic throughout its history. Um, whereas we don't have that baggage. It's a completely different paradigm uh, for us. Uh, so even though we are Muslims and we believe in absolute truths, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have the same sort of reaction uh, that, that Christians had in Christendom, for example, in Christian Europe, which was a disaster for all intents and purposes. But if you look at our history, um, we have a, a history of, of uh, scientific development and also um, a tolerance uh, and compassion for other religions. I mean, Ahlul Kitab, you know, the Quran mentions Ahlul Kitab. And Muslims in the second century came to realize that there are a lot more religions out there other than Jew Judaism and Christianity. What do we do with these Buddhists and these Hindus and so on and so forth? So through Ijtihad, that definition was expanded to include any religion that, that professes belief in some sort of scripture. So the Buddhists are Ahlul Kitab, Hindus are Ahlul Kitab. And this is the nature of Islamic ijtihad, is that it's rooted in the Quran. It makes absolute truth claims, but it's, it also recognizes that there are other truths in the world that deserve respect, especially uh, the, the, the life of human beings is sacrosanct. And I think that's, that's um, extremely important for contemporary Muslims to realize um, that also during the colonial period, you know, after the Ottomans 
uh, were dismantled. You have France and, and England and America and Italy um, carving up West Afri oh, North Africa and bringing their literalist interpretation of scripture to those peoples and also nationalism. So now there's one way of reading the scripture, my way or the highway. Where does that come from? That's not in our tradition. The question was never, is there a metaphorical reading of the Quran? The question was always, how many levels of meta metaphorical reading are there in the Quran? Obviously, there is a literal reading. No one denies it. No one has denied it. Zahiran, walil Qur'ani zahiran mubatin. Imam Ghazali says, Mishkatul uh, Anwar, uh, that there's an exoteric aspect and an esoteric aspect. But we, what we took from uh, the, the colonialists in the Middle East and in North Africa is one way of reading the text, and that's a violent way, because it's my way or the highway. Right? That's not in our tradition, that's something we took from, from others. Anyway, um, hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Uh, the third question was about uh, Jews, for Je oh, Jews, Jews for Jesus. Yeah, I saw this guy at UC Berkeley years ago. He's wearing a shirt that said Yeshua, right, which is the name of Isa alayhi salam in Aramaic. And he was passing this thing out. Uh, and uh, uh, he gave me this thing and it said, the end of the world is, you know, some, it says something like, I don't know, May something, 2010. This was years ago. And I said, what if it doesn't happen? And uh, he was from Jews for Jesus. And I said, I, he said, I guarantee you it's going to happen. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. So like May 22nd, the day after I come up to him, I said, you know, I said it didn't happen. He said, yes, I forgot the verse of that day knoweth no man. I forgot it. Satan tricked me. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I always run into these types of people, you know. Um, you know, this, this lady one time ambushed me in a coffee shop and she said, she just went on this diatribe about Palestine and, and so on and so forth. So I asked her, and, you know, I, she was a Christian. I said, uh, is Jesus God? She said, yeah, she, she said, yeah, Jesus is God. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament? She said, yes. Jesus is the God who commanded Moses and Joshua and the prophets? She said, yes. I said, when is it morally justifiable for Jesus to kill children? And she went, what? So in the Old Testament, the Lord commands Moses to go into 31 city-states and utterly decimate the entire population, men, women, and children, animals, burn down the city, loot the city. And she said, oh, that was, uh, that was the Old Testament, right? And you, you, know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. There's either two gods, and Jesus is another god, and that's, a, that's another god, and that was a Marcionite position, an early Christian position that was quite popular in Rome, right? Bi-theistic position. But no, she's not a Marcionite. So I said, look, either it's a different god, or, you know, God changed his mind, he has multiple personalities, you know, things like that, and that leads to a lot of different types of theological issues, and... And then she said, well, what about ISIS? And I said, look, I condemn ISIS, right? A lot of these Israeli officers in Palestine, they take these stories literally in the Old Testament. They take them literally. There's, a, there's actually a large community. Most academics, they're even Orthodox Jews, they don't take those stories literally. They said they're hyperbole, they're exaggerated. Um, they were meant to scare the enemies of Israel. They're not real. But there are some who believe that they're actually literally history. So a lot of them are officers of the Israeli army, and they quote these verses to justify genocide of indigenous Palestinian people. So I said, do you believe, do you, do you agree with what Israel is doing? She said, yes. And I said, then you are a terrorist, because I do not agree with ISIS, but you agree with Israel's policy. Right? When is it morally justifiable to kill women and children? No answer. You know, um, I mean, it's, Genesis 15 says that that land between the two rivers, and the Israeli flag has two blue lines, right? And that's the Nile and the Euphrates. So, you know, Gaza is nothing. They want half of Egypt. They want all of Iraq. Right? That's greater Israel. That's Haaretz Israel. That's called the land of Israel. Greater Israel, right? That's what they're trying to go for, right? At least the fundamentalists amongst them, the hardcore Zionists, that's considered major, uh, greater Israel. In Genesis 15, it says, God says to Abraham, I'll give that land to your seed, right? And, you know, if you look at that land, start at the Nile River and just go north until you get to the Euphrates. 
every town you pass by, they're making the adhan and saying, Muhammad Rasulullah. That's the seed of Abraham. The covenant was fulfilled. Okay? That's who it was. Um, so, and, more, and, this, and we have to also draw a distinction. It's very, very important that the majority of Jews are non-Zionists. The majority of Zionists are evangelical Christians. The majority of them are evangelical Christians. The majority of Orthodox Jews are completely against the state of Israel. Completely against it. If you, if you go to like, stand outside the Israeli embassy in San Francisco, half of the crowd are Orthodox Jews. They, uh, they put on these huge conferences that are never on TV, condemning Israel, because they say, look, we're a wandering people, and only the Messiah can come back and gather the dispersed from diaspora and set up the kingdom with justice, right? Cannot be done through political means. That's their aqidah, that's their belief, that's their interpretation. That's the majority opinion amongst the Jews, you know. But oftentimes what happens is that the, the, the fringe elements are the ones that are prevalent because they make for good TV ratings, and that's what we always hear about. You know, that's what we're gonna hear about. We don't, we don't hear about, you know, the orthodox, position, the majority position, because, you know, it's just boring. Who cares? What are these nut jobs doing out here on the fringe? You know, that's why, you know, I was at a church one time, and uh, it was a Unitarian Universalist church. So I'm thinking, okay, they're, they don't believe in the Trinity, so it's going to be kind of easy. It was the hardest, most difficult battering I've ever taken. Uh, one of them, uh, she said, she said, uh, you know, o older Caucasian lady, maybe in her, like, 80s, she stood up and she said, what's up with Johar Zanayev? I said, wow. I said, how did you learn that name? We hear it all the time. Johar Zanayev, that's a difficult name, isn't it? She said, yeah, it is quite difficult. So how do you know about the name? I don't know. I said, well, you're probably hearing it all the time. She said, yeah, it's on a 24-hour news cycle, right? Um, I said, have you heard of Wade Michael Page? Much easier name. Wade Michael Page. Just call him Wade Page. Have you heard of him? Never heard of him. Really? This is a man who's in the Aryan nation, former Marine, wearing fatigues, goes into a Gurdwara temple, a Sikh temple in Wisconsin, blows 12 people away, right? And thinking they were Muslim. No one's heard of him. Have you heard of Eric Rudolph? Never heard of him. You, never, you didn't hear about the man who blew up a bomb at the 96 Atlanta Games? You never heard of him? Never heard of him. Eric Rudolph, Christian terrorist, right? Zionist. Blew up Centennial Park in 1996. Blows up gay nightclubs. Blows up abortion clinics, killing doctors and nurses. No one's heard of him, right? Why? When do we hear about these people? Somebody's be, being miseducated, right? So have you heard of the Hutari movement? Hutari? What is that? You never heard of the Hutaris? You heard of Al-Qaeda? Oh, yeah. Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda. Of course. Al-Qaeda. Hutaris, yeah, a group of militant Christians in the Midwest that tried to take over the United States government. They have training camps. According to FBI, there are dozens of such Christian groups in Texas alone. Dozens. Terrorist groups trying to take over the country. Have you heard of any of them? The army of the, army of the Lord, the Lord's arm, the, the, the lambs of God, the Ku Klux Klan, 1945, not that long, people remember this, 50,000 Klansmen marched on Washington. They had membership of 4 million people in 1945. That's more than American Jews. These people just disintegrate? What happened to them? They're gone? No, they're still around. They integrated into the police force, into the Republican Party. They're still around. They don't just disintegrate. Democratic Party, yeah. They don't fall off the face of the earth, right? But people, you know, think about these things, right? They don't even hear about these things. It's very strange. Anyway, that was my spiel to use a Yiddish word.
You guys heard of Robert Bales? That's the last one I mentioned. Robert Bales. You ever heard of him? Very, Bob Bales. Easy, huh? Bobby Bales. <laughs> Bobby Bales goes into uh, Kandahar, Afghanistan, and he kills 16 people. Nine of them are children, burning them. Burning them. He's an American military man. Who's heard of him? Who cares? No one's heard of him. You know. I mean, ISIS burns man, one man alive, and obviously we condemn it. La yanbaghi an yu'adhiba bin nar illa rabbu nar, the Prophet said, is not becoming of anyone to punish or torture with fire, except the Lord of fire, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We condemn it completely. But who's heard of Bobby Bales? You know what happened in 1963 at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Bombingham, Alabama? Does anyone remember that? Bombingham, that's what he used to call it. You know. So we don't study history. We start pointing the fingers at people. I mean, why is this group in Iraq? Why are they there? You have 24 years of American aggression and invasion, depleted uranium, hundreds of thousands of children are dying for 24 years. You have sanctions put on that country, invasion of, uh, under false pretenses. What do you expect to happen? People are going to lay down and die for you? What do you expect? Obviously, we, can, we condemn ISIS, obviously. But why is it happening? What's going on? You know. Anyway. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's my, that's, I think that's right on. I mean, because right now it's, it's, yeah, there's a hadith of the Prophet where he says there's going to be a time when there's so much confusion in the world. The best thing you can do is take some of your sheep and goats and just go live up in the mountains and just get away from all of that type of thing. You know, um, and I think those are, those are times that are, that are rapidly approaching upon us that we need to safeguard our deans because it's very, very, um, you know, people go surfing online and things like that and they want to know what's going on. No one really knows what's going on. And you can sit there for hours and hours and hours, watch video, YouTube after YouTube after YouTube, and just be obsessed and be depressed and become cynical. But the Prophet ﷺ, he said, if you're planting a seed and the hour comes upon you, the day of judgment, finish planting your seed. You're never going to see that seed grow, right? Because the hour, but finish planting. I mean, we have to keep working. Just keep working. The point is to keep moving, right? And if need be, just turn all these things off. My advice is, and I have to, you know, I have to do research and things like that sometimes, just to be able to be able to, you know, answer some of these claims that are being made. But, you know, my best moments are just me and my subha or my, my Quran memorizing, just reading a nice text, you know, um, turning off gadgets and things like that, because you can become obsessed with it. And it can really affect the deen. And there's a lot of ridda. There's a lot of apostasy happening right now. These people are trying to figure these things out. They keep digging and digging and digging. Most of the information on the internet is probably wrong anyway or biased. So Muslims are falling into this quagmire of confusion. So then they go to the, their parents who are immigrants to the country. Dad, is there really a God? Ah, astaghfirullah, go make wudu. How dare you ask this question? Yeah, but I want to know. Ah, astaghfirullah, go pray. Ask Allah to give you the answer. And that's not going to work for them. Because their crisis is not of orthopraxis, it's of orthodoxy. Well, why do I believe this? So then they go to the university professor, who's got a PhD in philosophy, but he's a Muslim, anti-Muslim polemicist. He said, Mr. Professor, yes? What do you think about Islam? Oh, come to my office hour. And khalas, he walks out, kafir, he's murtad, walking out of his office. And then, I know a lot of Muslim youth, like, they're, they're just feigning in front of their parents. They come to Jummah, they read their mushaf, they're atheists. They don't even believe in it. I'm just, you know, I'm going through the motions. It's my dad, you know, I can't wait to move out so I can, you know, be my own man. And it's what's happening. You know, so, you know, you could take that literally, go up, you know, whatever. Um, you know, or you can say, you know what, I'm going to detach myself from all this type of fitna, you know, protect my flock, my, my limbs, my family members, you know, my faculties, just protect it, completely cut it off from all of that madness and fitna and confusion, and just do the best I can with the people around me, inshallah. And don't underestimate you know, any type of 
you know, educational opportunity, even if it's one person, you know. Every good idea started with one person, right? You never know who you're going to talk to, who you're going to influence. Um, so, yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. So my question is like two parts. Um, so it sounds like from what you're saying, like the immorality of atheism is sort of forced or like conditioned. Or it's its own like belief system. Yeah. So in order to believe it, you have to be conditioned to believe it. Um, so the first part of the question is that from what you know from an atheist perspective, um, where does that belief system come from? that you're conditioned to believe that immorality, where does that come from? And then so the second part is that if, for example, you mentioned Crowley, Jewish style world, right? So mm -hmm. if you have to be conditioned to believe this or adopt this ideology, do as you will, then what did you believe prior to that? Something that you were probably, that was inherent. So where yeah. did that come from? So then what, both sides of the, of the spectrum from an atheist perspective, where do they come from? Mm -hmm. Where does the immorality come from? And then where does the morality come from that you're inherently born with? Yeah, that's a good question. Because definitely atheists, they take moral stances. And most atheists will say that they believe in objective morality. But it comes from their understanding of the world and their experiences. But it's totally relative, and that's the problem with it. I mean, most, most of the time, I think they get it right. You know, you, know, you don't see atheists on the street, you know, um, killing each other and stealing things and things like that. I mean, they they follow the laws of their country that they live in and they're generally good people. Um, so that's, I think that's also, there's some conditioning that goes there as far as uh, the society goes. Uh, and that's, that's been my question is where do they get their morality from? That's always been my question, right? And the atheists will say, well, look, this is what happened. We, you know, we were, we were apes back in the day and the apes that killed each other, they didn't survive and the apes that sort of w learned to work with each other. Uh, so they learned it through that type of conditioning, right? And that's sort of, that's sort of their answer. Um, but I don't know. I mean, your, your question is a question that, that, I, that I've been asking for years, you know. Um, you know, so that's a, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Well, judgment is the prerogative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I can't comment on that. What I can say is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, he prophesies the neo khawarij right? People who are going to come from time to time with that same type of mentality that believe that, they're, that they have the truth and that everyone else is on falsehood. And they make takfir of anybody. And they don't discriminate in their takfir. They make takfir of Ali Atai all the way up to Ali ibn Abi Talib. They don't, whoever doesn't agree with me, they're a kafir. And the Prophet وسلم, he described them and he said that, you know, they, they, they pass through the religion like an arrow passes through its target, meaning they deviate very quickly. And then he said that they are the worst of creation. He said they recite the Quran, but it doesn't go below their throat. They make supplication, it doesn't ri rise above their head. Right after he mentioned that they recite the Quran, he said, they're sharrul bariya. They're the worst of creation. So the ulama said, wait a minute, worst of creation? I thought they're Muslim. How can they be the worst of creation? So the ulama said, they're the worst of creation because not only do they hinder people away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they defame the name of the Prophet sallallahu They're guilty of defamation of character against the Prophet sallallahu Right? So judgment is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, according to orthodox Islam, normative ash'ari maturidi and this is not you know as one of my teachers said this is not our california creed you know imam ghazali says that if someone uh, was given a distorted form of islam and they were told their whole lives muslims are crazy they're terrorists they they're they're abusive uh they worship the moon god whatever they're being told uh and uh, they die that person is safe from the fire that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will manifest divine amnesty for that person on the yom al qiyamah because a requisite of taklif, taklif means responsibility or burden to become Muslim, is that you were reached by a sound prophetic summons, a prophetic summons that was sound. So obviously there's been a lot of good people in the world that weren't Muslim, and this is something to think about. You go around the world to these ancient Christian monasteries, 
Trinitarian monasteries. They have open air tombs, open air. There's a monk, he's out in the open. He's not decomposing. Why? I thought he was a Kafir. He believes in the Trinity. What happened? Something to think about. You know, this is the form of Christianity this man was reached with, Trinitarian Christianity. And he was a mukhlis in that tradition. And he loved Isa alayhi salam. And Allah, Allahu alam, we're not ones to judge. Right? So it's very difficult for me to, you know, what happens at this person? Allahu alam. I don't know. I can only tell you what I've seen in my experiences and what the Quran tells us. A kafir will go to Jahannam khalidan fiha. A kafir. The question is, what is a kafir? What is a kafir? So any non Muslim is a kafir? It's black and white? I mean, there's an opinion like that. But the, minor, but the majority opinion is a kafir is someone that Allah describes in Al Baqarah. Wa la talbisu al haqqa bil batri wa taqtumu al haqqa. Do not clothe truth with falsehood, nor conceal the truth while you have knowledge of the truth. So who can we actually say is a kafir? Who can we actually say? Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal, Fir'aun, Haman, Qarun, a handful of people, everybody else, Allahu Alam. I'm not Allah. And for me to judge people, you're going to go to hell? That's shirk, because I'm putting myself in the position, as it were, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I've committed shirk if I did that. So, and that's something, you know, we shouldn't give up on people either. I mean, I was in a masjid one time, and there was a halakha, there was a Christian brother was there, and the Christian brother was asking really tough questions, but he was being respectful. Uh, uncle walks into the masjid, he listens for two minutes, and he goes, brother, you waste your time with these kuffar. <laughs> Allah has sealed their hearts. They are blind, they are deaf, they are stupid. Waste your time on kafir. I said, you gave him two minutes of your time. The Prophet ﷺ gave 20 years to Abu Sufyan, a man who's trying to kill him. And he didn't give up on him. And eventually he became Muslim. And that's the best da'i. Wa da'iyan ilallahi bi'idni wa siraja munira. The best da'i cannot convert a man in 20 years, but you come into the masjid two minutes and try to convert him, he says, he's kafir. <laughs> oh. Yes, wa alaikum salam. The Book of Treasury. It's called Sacred Treasury. Oh, I haven't heard of it. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I book, uh, recommend a book, um, uh, when, when Atheism Becomes Religion by Chris Hedges. Really good book. You should get that book. Awesome book. Chris Hedges. When Atheism Becomes Religion. Also, God and the New Atheism by John Hott. Yeah. Excellent book. Yeah. Yeah, so agnostic is more humbler. An agnostic, you know, A is the, the alpha privative, which means to negate, is the negating alpha. So, in other words, an agnostic says, I don't know. I don't, I'm open to be persuaded, right? So that's a better position than an atheist who said, no, there's no God, and khalas, you can't, that's, you can't persuade me, right? Uh, although a lot of atheists are really agnostic. I mean, they say, well, I don't know if there's, a, there's no God, but I'm open to a conversation. But anti-theists are these people we're dealing with that just yani, um, uh, oppose religion completely and believe that it's just a poison that needs to be eradicated from the earth. Um, so yeah, an agnostic which really means someone who doesn't know. And we're all to a certain degree agnostic, all of us, even if we're believers. Obviously we have faith convictions, but to a certain degree, we all, obviously we don't, we don't know certain things. Um, and the Prophet wasallam said that when we are resurrected on the Yom Al-Qiyamah, we're going to see things much more clearly and think that this was a dream, right? Just like, just like when we're dreaming, we're thinking, and I, I do this sometimes when I'm dreaming, I'm thinking, is this a dream? No. Right? Inside the dream, but it is. Right? Um, so, yes. Jazakallah khair. <laughs>